Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. I'm Liz, and I'm an alcoholic. Oh, my Lord. So Jimmy asked me to speak. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Jimmy. A year ago, and I haven't slept since. So if I uh, seem a little bit weird up here, you know, that's what lack of sleep will do to a person. Um, yeah, it's crazy. I, I've i never done anything like this at an event like this. Um, I've been asked to speak a couple times, and I'm so much, I'm a person who's just so much more comfortable with like literature and facts in front of me that I can just always go back to. And uh, this is absolutely terrifying to me. Um, but you know, my sponsor made it very clear to me, it's just a job. It's a job in Alcoholics Anonymous. And this, it's your turn in the barrel, kid, and you gotta go up there and uh, you know, you ask God to speak through you, use you, and uh, do what he will. And uh, honestly, God has, I already know that that's going to happen. I have no idea what I'm going to say. Not one clue. You'd think you have a year to think about this. Like, get your shit together. You know, you have a year. Like, at least come up with, like, an opening line. Nothing. Nothing. I'm awake for a whole year, can't sleep, and not one thing comes to me. I'm like, this is terrible. Like, throw me a bone. Anything. Please. Um, but I, I do have to say that, like, I'll start by just saying that, like, Alcoholics Anonymous has changed my life. Alcoholics Anonymous is the best thing on this earth. We have found much of heaven here on earth, right here, right now, and that is my truth. That is my truth. I look. I need look no further. I don't have to look any further than the tables that I see out there of the most amazing people who light my life up on a daily basis from my home group who showed up for me tonight. I gotta tell you though, there is a little bit of a spoiler. The woman who was sitting next to me told me that her husband had 30 people from his home group go see him in Florida. And they're from like, where are you from? From very far from Florida. <laughs> I said, no, my people don't like me that much. <laughs> I don't know about that. But, uh, thanks for coming anyway, guys. I still love you. Um, and, uh, I have a confession to make also. Um, I don't know why. I just feel like when you speak, you have to be like a clear channel and, you know, have nothing blocking you, like a tabula rasa, and uh, I did let one of my sponsees steal tissues out of the bathroom, so now I feel a little bit better, thank you, <laughs> but I needed them really bad. Um, so yeah, I, I um, didn't just show up at Alcoholics Anonymous because I wanted to. Um, I didn't even know that this thing existed. I wish that so many more did know that this existed, and I know that um, people in service are really doing a good job trying to get the word out there to the sick and suffering who don't know about this deal, because honestly, it's like nothing but divine intervention, the fact that I even found out what Alcoholics Anonymous was. Um, I was a train wreck for a lot of years, and I worked, the only reason I was employable at all was because my husband's sister employed me. And I worked at a child care center, and uh, I used to take care of the kids there, lucky them. And uh, as I was trying to show up and do the best that I could when I showed up to work, um, there was this man who would drop his kids off, and it ended up that he was my neighbor down the street. And I would take care of his kids, and I fell in love with his baby. I thought his baby was the cutest baby I'd ever seen, and I just loved them. And we ended up becoming really good friends with these people. And I had no idea that this man was in Alcoholics Anonymous, and he had been sober for um, quite some time. And so we had uh, become friends with their family, and uh, I don't know if he knew the severity of what was going on in my home, but obviously he probably knew something was up. And uh, as events unfolded in our life, my husband likes to remind me that he's two years sober longer than me. <laughs> and... um my husband had gotten arrested at a 7-Eleven by our house for having some non-conference approved dry goods in his pocket, um, which he had hidden, but yet confessed to the cops that he had stuff. <laughs> so again, divine intervention. <laughs> and uh, the first thing I thought to do at the time was to call my neighbor, Brian. And um, when my husband went to detox, Brian, Brian didn't let my husband walk in the door. He picked my husband up outside my house, and he said, don't even go in the house. I don't know if you'll ever come out, get in my car. 
and he started taking my husband to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. And um, at the time, I had been abstinent, and I had stopped doing most things, which in my mind was good enough, because um, I was with child. So all of that seemed well, and my husband um, started going to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings, and I had this child, and I had this great idea that, you know, as bad as things had gotten in my life, that I couldn't bring into my mind the pain, the suffering, and the humiliation of what had happened to me only a short time ago, and I thought that I could successfully drink again. And with my husband's permission, I picked up a drink on New Year's, and I said, I think I can really do it. And honestly, no, nobody could have convinced me otherwise. Nobody could have told me, like, that might not be a good idea, and I would have listened. I had to know. I was convinced that I could do this successfully. Um, I started drinking New Year's of the year after my daughter was born, and within seven short months, I was as bad, if not worse, than I ever was before. And um, I decided that uh, life had gotten really, really bad in a really, really scary place and that I had to divorce my husband because it was his fault. <laughs> so I set up an appointment to meet with my husband with no kids around, and I asked his sister to please watch my children because I had to keep this appointment because I needed him to go. It was time. And uh, just like he threw those pills at the cop that night, I sat in the car next to him. I looked at him. I had a million things I wanted to say, and I looked at him, and I said, nothing. I couldn't say a word, and he just looked at me and said, what is wrong with you? What is going on? And I had gotten so out of control and so bad that um, I couldn't do anything else but just roll up my pant legs and roll up my arm legs and show him that I had mutilated my body once again because when I drink, I drink. I drink to a place that's so dark and that I, and I try to hide it and I just can't do that. I was losing my mind and I was uh, hallucinating and I was tearing apart my body. Um, I want to say that that was my last time that I drank. I did go to rehab, but by every form of self-deception, I always thought, like, I, you know that old 80, like that commercial with the, the say no to drugs, and they would have like an egg in a frying pan, and they would crack the egg and they would say, this is your brain on drugs. I like really believe that they had that backwards. Like that's not my brain on drugs or drinking. I'm the egg put together. That's what happens to me when I drug and I drink. I don't fall apart. I feel together. I do. I felt whole, and I felt like I couldn't walk around on this earth without something in me. I had to find the right chemical combination. And by every form of self-deception, I did. I tried everything. I tried everything. I went to every smoke shop, every vape shop, every liquor store, every type of anything I could mix. I had to be thoroughly convinced without a doubt that something in me was broken, was completely broken. I was, I, I had become convinced. I had been, I had been surrendered. Something happened to me that I got to a place that no matter what I put in me, no matter what I tried to do to quiet the noise that was going on inside my head, that nothing could do it anymore. Absolutely nothing took away the pain and the suffering of being me. Nothing. I was solutionless, and I honestly didn't understand because I had seen him go in Alcoholics Anonymous. I had seen my neighbor in Alcoholics Anonymous, and my neighbor who was, like, an Alcoholics Anonymous, he's the type of guy that could, like, go on, like, a crack run and come into Alcoholics Anonymous and the next day go, like, paint the side of his house and start, like, gardening. And I didn't understand why that wasn't happening to me. Like, I have nothing in me. I'm, I'm separated physically from all substance, and why do I feel like I'm dying? What is that? I must be special. I must be different from everybody in these rooms. I didn't understand what I was suffering from. And I would go to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings, terrified, scared to death, and I would sit with my head down in the back of the meeting, praying that nobody spoke to me, but please recognize me, but please don't talk to me, but please recognize me, and have this internal battle constantly. And I would sit in those meetings, and I would sit there and... I would suffer. I would suffer from my own thinking, and I would stay silent and stay in the back. And I'll tell you, the problem for me did exist long before I ever picked up a drink or a drug. I'm clear on that now, because when I look back at my childhood and I look back at me growing up, like, I was absolutely never comfortable in my own skin. 
Like, I've heard a couple people in here say it before. I actually never knew it was, like, a real thing, but I would go around and say, like, oh, yeah, I'm a nurse's office kid. Like, I spent, like, half my life in the nurse's office. You know, I was always restless, irritable, discontent. I was uncomfortable. I, I just was crawling out of my skin. I was constantly comparing myself to others, always falling short or always thinking that I'm better than somebody. And talk about a conflict. Like, how is it that somebody can be so absolutely broken, split wide open, and yet you offer me help and I tell you to get away from me? I don't want your help. You know, help me, help me, but don't. And especially don't tell me what to do. I was just telling little Jen before the meeting, I went from a place of complete defiance, as broken as I was, so defiant and so unwilling to listen to what the people in AA were saying. And now I'm at this place where, like, Please tell me what to do. Like, and I, I love it. I love when somebody tells me what to do. I asked Mary back before the meeting. I said, you know, these are really high shoes and I'm going to walk up there. And when I get up there, is it okay if I take them off? And she looked at me and she said, no. No, it's not okay. And I was like, oh, God, that's so refreshing. Like back in the day, that would annoy me. I was like, I love it. You know, and then we asked, uh, Mari, um, what her opinion was on, cause I respect her opinion. I said, well, what do you think a woman should wear to the podium to give a talk? How do you feel? And she, there was no flinching. She said, a dress. You treat this place like church. You wear a dress. I love that. I love that. I, my soul needs that. I crave that. I didn't know that. I did everything in my power to push people away who gave me direction. I did everything in my power to push anything good for me away. And the truth is, is that's what my soul's hungry for. I'm hungry for direction. I'm hungry for positivity. I'm hungry to be led. If it wasn't for people in this room and Alcoholics Anonymous that I could see, touch, feel, who I had respect for, who are leaders in my eyes, I don't know if I'd be here. I've seen, I see the power of God working in you guys. I, I don't need to meet God face to face. I see him in the eyes of people like the kid who just spoke at my home group yesterday. I saw him when he came in. He wanted to fight the whole world if you looked at him. He's lit up about Alcoholics Anonymous. He can't talk enough about Alcoholics Anonymous and what it's done for him. That victory over them, we may bear witness to those I will help of thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. That, 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 that I, that God has given me this gift, that he has resurrected me from the place that I was in, the place of darkness to the place that I am now. It's undeniable. So I come into Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm giving you a little bit of a background about what was going on. And the truth is, is that you can't see the picture when you're in the frame, right? Like, the alcoholic life is the absolute only normal life. I don't realize how bad I am. I'm telling you now that I was bad, but I really didn't realize how sick I was. I had no idea. I just made amends to some girl recently, a... Um, my daughter's friend, and she said, Liz, I just, she said, I just, you are a recluse. You're not that person anymore. She said, you wore your hair in front of your face all the time because of what you had done to your face. I just couldn't stop picking my face apart. I just couldn't stop. I couldn't stop. And like, when you're in that, you don't even realize what you look like or what you've done. I remember when, when I first got sober, I thought, Having to look around, it's like somebody just ripped the Band-Aid off your eyes, and you're just like, oh, my God. Like, was I, in a, I was literally in a coma for years. I can't believe it. My bathroom wall's caving in on us. The, the roof is shot. The whole, you wouldn't believe. that You wouldn't believe what I was living in. I couldn't believe what I was living in. Me, who had prided myself on being so together and clean when I was young, I couldn't believe what I, the filth I was living in. I couldn't believe that I had aged. You know, I still sometimes am in denial of that. You know, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll be dressed up, dressed up, and my daughter's like, you know, it's not 1986, right? And I'm like, well, that's where I left off. <laughs> still a work in progress. You know, some of the people in my home group call me Tiffany. <laughs> um, so yeah, like this thing, like I had no idea what was happening to me, and I'll tell you the truth, like. God, I heard a speaker say this, and I'm sure people in this room have heard this, but one of the things that was the most profound I heard a speaker say that really spoke to my soul was that God pushes each man and woman to the edge of his or her own cliff. And I felt that. I felt that because it doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter what works for you or what works for her or what works for him. What worked for me, God used all of me, good and bad. God, I'm a vain person. I am vain. I had ripped my face apart. 
ripped it apart. I was missing half the right side of my face over here. I've had multiple surgeries. I had to go to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings, cut from here to here and here to here with stitches down my face. And I showed up to Alcoholics Anonymous, and that's not out of pride. That's out of desperation. I showed up to Alcoholics Anonymous because guess what? I finally realized this was the last stop on the block. Nothing else fixed me. I had already tried all the chemicals. I had already tried all the pills. I had already tried all the psychiatrists. I had already tried all the doctors. I had even tried going to AA at my, my terms, my cost, my terms, right? I started going to AA meetings, and I would go, like, you know, right at the time that it started, dip out when it was only women's meetings. I had a whole bunch of rules, you know. I always had an excuse. Something was always wrong. We know these people. We sponsor them. <laughs> I was that person. I was terrible. I went through six sponsors in Alcoholics Anonymous in the beginning. Nobody. I would walk in the room, and people would just the other way, you know. I remember greeting and, like, people standing in front of me, like, don't even let her shake their hands. <laughs> her misery might catch on to them. But uh, I kept coming. I kept coming. And uh, people in Alcoholics Anonymous never kicked me out. They never stopped, uh, you know, putting their hand out to me. And my last sponsor, um, one of my last sponsor changes after my run through all six, uh, this woman had said to me um, that she had her, her mother was, I had been dumped by my last two sponsors. One of them was because they had an emotional crisis with a man. And, you know, you can't arm somebody with the facts who's witty like us and then dump me because I looked right at her and I said, doesn't it say throw yourself harder into helping others? When I know it says when sex becomes troublesome, but isn't it when anything becomes troublesome, we throw ourselves harder into helping others? She didn't like that too much. She still dumped me. Um, and then she sent me to her sponsor, and then by a series of circumstance, her sponsor's um, mom was passing, and, and it was very traumatic, and the woman was very close to her mother, and she had a lot of sponsees, so she had just said, you know, I think, honey, I just think you need a lot of extra attention and help. <laughs> and so I called the only person left that I could think of, that was a woman in Alcoholics Anonymous, who was really mean, and I didn't like her. <laughs> And I called this woman and I said, hey, um, my last sponsor dumped me and I don't really know what to do. And, but, and that was it. She told me exactly what to do. And I wasn't used to being told what to do, but this woman told me what to do. And I was, I was out of options. I ran out of road out there. I ran out of road in Alcoholics Anonymous. So I'm sitting here and this woman tells me what to do and I do it. For the first time in my whole life, I shut my mouth and I just did it. And I did everything she said. I showed up at meetings like I had never showed up to before. No excuses. She didn't care if my stomach hurt, my leg was falling off, my eye was pussing. She said, put a patch on it, get there. There was nothing that I, and I, and I was terrified, but I was desperate and I did it. I started showing up. I started showing up in spite of myself. Scars on my face, bandages on my face. People would bring me tubs of lubricant. They're like, just slap it on there. Like, who cares? One of the guys in my home group looked at me. I love him. I don't know if he's here tonight. I he's here. He knows I'm going to say it. I love him so much. He's just one of the most honest human beings I've ever met, which is hard to find in Alcoholics Anonymous. He is so honest. He looked at me, and he was like, you know, with your face like that. At least you'll know who your true friends are. <laughs> and he's one of them. He's one of my true friends. Meet the best people in the world here. So, uh, yeah, I started listening to direction. And I was still, I mean, it's not like I came in and, like, started taking some direction. Poof, I felt all better. Like, that's not the truth. The truth is, is that I was in a lot of pain and I was used to live in a certain way. I was used to, the only thing my mind knows how to do is to keep me sick. So my mind always tries to fix the problem. I'm always trying to, to create an atmosphere of ease and comfort. But the ease and comfort that I'm trying to create, I grab onto things that don't cause ease and comfort. Like, I, I'm a recluse. Like, I'm the girl who doesn't, I had trouble going to stores. And it was a little bit embarrassing walking out of the house like that with an ego the size of mine. It was terrible. I would walk into the store, and I thought everybody was looking at me, you know? And I, and, and I, and I, that was my truth. I became pretty much agoraphobic. And, yes, a lot of it had to do with my vanity because my face. And I thought I was that important. I did. And I would sit in the house, and I wouldn't want to do anything. And the truth is, is that recovery 
and, and change and all the great stuff that comes from this stuff happens when I do things in spite of myself. When it goes, some of the most beautiful things in the whole world have happened to me from doing things that go against every grain of my being. Every single fiber of my being wants to tell you that I can't. And Alcoholics Anonymous tells you, yes, you can, and yes, you will. And I needed that. I never had that. You can't lead a horse to water. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. I wasn't just led here. I was, I was, I was prodded. I was encouraged. I was lifted up. I was brought to the water. I was brought by women who were stronger than me, who knew that I was full of shit and that I was deceiving myself, that I suffered from illusions and delusions, and that the only way through them was to walk through them. That was it. There was no shortcuts. There was no way around it. I sat in my sponsor, my sponsor's um, driveway. We were doing a big book study, and we met once a week at her house, and I sat in the driveway, and I couldn't get in the house. I was having a self-pity party all by myself, and uh, it was a really good one. I mean, like, I was... I was like in full on tears and hysterics. I had gotten myself choked up and nobody knows what it's like. And as a woman, our faces are so important and nobody could ever walk around like this and blah, 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 and all this stuff. And I'm sitting in the car and I meant it though. Like I meant it. Like I don't mean to minimize that pain. That pain was real. When you're in it, you think it's like, it's the truth. And she looked at me, and I really thought she was going to feel some compassion. I did. She looked right at me. She looked me in my eyes. She put her arm around me and she said, I need you to put on your big girl panties and walk in my house. And I, that was it. And I was like, that's it. She's like, yeah, now. <laughs> so I dried my face and I went in her house and I loved her. I still love her. If it wasn't for somebody who was brave enough to not give a crap what I thought about them, who was not afraid of like, you know, me not liking her, I wouldn't be here right now. I didn't like everything she said. I look back now, that woman saved my life. The people in Alcoholics Anonymous saved my life. My current sponsor today has saved my life. My current sponsor today has given me one of the most valuable gifts that you can give another alcoholic. My sponsor today has given me time. My sponsor today has given me so much time. Anything I, I used to call and, and everything in my life was an immediately, you know, a 10 step when something disturbs us, we call some, everything was an immediately, you know, everything had such a high level of importance. And I was never dismissed. I was never dismissed. I was always just set back right, set back right. You know, my thinking goes left. Somebody else set it right for me. Um, the other thing I could say is that when I did get here, that I would hear things about God in the rooms. And I, that resonated with me. I wasn't, like, practicing any type of religion, and I, I didn't really believe that this God could work for me in my life or any of that stuff. Um, but when I was a kid, my Nana was really religious, and she had an altar in her house. And my nana, like, helped raise me when I was little. And she used to have an altar, and she used to have all this religious stuff around her house, and I was always fascinated with it. I did go to CCD, so I was exposed, you know, I was exposed to this stuff. And um, she was the most kind, beautiful soul. Like, I could show up there in crisis at 17, 18, 19, and just show up in the middle of the night, and she'd be like, you know where to go, honey, just go on there, just always a safe haven, um, and she was an example of what I believed was safety, security, and a lot like what I think God looks like, like that, that thing that was missing, that, that thing, it just, I never felt safe, I never felt secure, I never felt comfortable, and I felt okay there. When I was in crisis, that's always where I went. So I had this exposure, and I remember her, and my family, I don't know how she got my dad to go, because he's not, I don't know, but she got my dad to even go to um, all these different places, like Fatima and Medjugorje, and they started following around, like, from the Marian apparitions, which was the Virgin Mary appearing to Sears. And uh, they brought home these books and these rosary beads. I don't know why I wanted them so bad, but I wanted them. I wanted these I kept these rosary beads all the time. And like I said, I'm not religious. And I started praying. And 
like reading about this stuff, and I had this interest. I had this interest. I think I've always been interested in magic. I've always been interested in something that could just be big enough to stop it. Just be big enough to stop the noise. Be big enough to make me not feel so damn insignificant all the time. And, uh, sorry. And then when I was 17, I went because my cousin convinced me to go on this religious retreat. Again, I'm not religious. She's really big into church. She's actually a, a teacher at a Catholic school, and she's really into that and stuff. And she dragged me on this retreat, and I had been doing some really bad things, like getting into my teenage years, and I was doing not the right stuff. And I had this boyfriend, and I was smoking cigarettes since I was, like, 12. And, you know, totally living different than my cousins, you know. They were really, like, rule followers and stuff, and I just wasn't. I wasn't, and she, I, I don't know why I ended up going on this retreat with her, but I did. And I go on this retreat, and we're out on the beach. And I am, like, obsessive-compulsive bondage of self doesn't even cover what goes on inside my head. Like, I have, like, rules and rigidity and things that I need to be okay at all times. And I show up to this religious retreat with, like, you know, tons of suitcases and crap. And she's like, we're camping out on the beach. Like, you can't wear makeup. I'm like, I have, like, a whole suitcase of makeup. <laughs> So I show up to this retreat, day one, terrible, day two, terrible, day three, it's the home of the giant mosquitoes. I am covered with sunburn on my white skin from the top of my head to the bottom of my toes, and I have welts all over me, day three, and I'm like, this is not for me. Please, somebody get me out of here and get me home. I'm so glad I stayed for day four. That night we had a campfire, and the priests were giving a talk, and they started talking about God, and I don't know what they were saying. I couldn't tell you. I just know I sobbed. I sobbed. I sobbed. I sobbed. Something got in me that night, and like Bill says, worldly clamors once again blotted it out, but something happened to me that night. It was one of the first real experiences I had had with knowing that there was something big out there. There was something big out there that I was craving because all the noise stopped for a little while. And I went on that vacation for the next six days, makeup free, living in the sand, living by the seat of my pants. I had never been able to do that. I, I mean, I'm still not a pro at that. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> My husband laughed a little too hard at that. Um, but I know all about bondage of self. You know, my sister, um, we asked for the relief of the bondage of self, right? And my, my sister's one of us, and my other sister's one of us, and my daughter has a lot of our isms because she grew up around it. And she texted me this morning, and she said, you know, Aunt Jen, um, Aunt Jen is so obsessive. She makes me look not obsessive. And I said, pray for her. Because being obsessive is one of the most painful things a person can be. You can't get out of your own way. You just can't. And I said, that was one of my problems is I put down the drink, I put down the drugs, I put down everything, and I, I, I'm left with this. And I had like 5,000 other obsessions just running my life. You know, and it's easy to put, it's not easy to put down a drink, don't get me wrong, but when you're practicing complete abstinence from a drink, I can't, compl I can't practice complete abstinence from life. You know, I can't. I, there was no way for me to do that. I'd have to live in a bubble. And that's what my mind tells me to do. It says, go in the box, Liz. Go in the box. Go in the bubble. Go where it's safe. And then I'm in my own man-made prison once again. I'm in my own prison. And the only way out is through once again. And that's what Alcoholics Anonymous has helped me do. It has helped me break down the walls of this, this prison. Because there's times that, like, it's no fun when your head starts going, like I've said to my sponsor currently, I'm like, you know, I just want to like go to a store and leave myself home. Like, is that possible? <laughs> like, I just want a break from me. <laughs> and uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, there's people who say that they don't meditate in Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, sitting through a 45-minute talk, sitting through a meeting, I mean, that's meditation for a lot of us. It might not be the whole deal, but that's a big thing for us. Like to not get up and make a cup of coffee, like to actually pay attention to what somebody else is saying and not what your mind is doing for a whole 45 minutes. Wow, what a trick. He got us. 
you know? And we get some pretty entertaining people. Alcoholics Anonymous is seriously the most amazing place on the earth. You meet the most amazing, colorful, extra fun people there are. And I, I was just saying to little Jen before the meeting, I said, you know, I had one of my sponsees send me inventory recently and, and it was filled with resentments towards people in AA. And I got so excited. I got so, I was literally like, I, I was so happy and I had to call them. I was like, I'm, I loved your inventory. It was so great. And they were like, what? That was like the craziest inventory I ever sent you. And I said, that just means you're in AA. Welcome to the NFL. If you don't have a resentment against someone in Alcoholics Anonymous, you're not in here. Like if you, if somebody in AA has not annoyed you, you know, welcome, welcome. But it gives us what I always needed, a thicker skin and a thinner head. It's given me what I've always needed. I had no idea I needed that. I've taken everything personal my entire life. You know, the world and its people dominate me is an understatement. Alcoholics Anonymous has given me that thicker skin, that thinner head, where now people can be people and has nothing to do with me half the time. And when it does, guess what? I get to bitch about it to my sponsor and write inventory. I have a girl that um, is in our home group, and I love what she said last night. We have, we our group is growing up. I'm part of the fourth dimension, in case I didn't mention it, in Tom's River, New Jersey. We meet on Wednesday nights at 7:30, and it is. I love this place. It's a great place to visit if you get a chance. And we have one of the girls who just started leading our business meetings, and we've always had like super calm business meetings. Super calm. Everyone gets along. Never an issue. And we had like our first like real like fight. And I not fight, but like people were like kind of going at each other. It was exciting. It was fun. <laughs> and the girl that I sponsored, she like held it down, man. She held it down. And she said something so cool at the end. She was like, you know what? This is why we put in the policy that if you have any new business, that you are to send it to the secretary the week before so that you have time for prayer consideration, inventory if necessary, and discussion with others so that when you come back, we're an informed group conscience. Mic drop. I had to repeat it. It was so good. It was so good. I was like, I sponsor her. (laughs) So... Alcoholics Anonymous is unbelievable. You know, they talk a lot about like six and seven and trying to act the opposite and all this stuff. And I, I, I know that it gets confusing for people who are newer. And I know we have a lot of seasoned vets around here who have been acting the opposite at all times, always. Um, but I remember one of the biggest reliefs I ever got was that like when somebody in AA just told me like, hey, Liz, it's not your job to change you. Like, it's God's job. Yes, you're responsible for the effort, but you're not responsible for the outcome. I get that, but ask God to change you. And it sounds so mystical and, like, really? I just ask him to change me. And and my truth is, is yes, that without prayer, prayer without action doesn't work. But without prayer, there's nothing either. If I'm not asking God for help, nothing has come to me. I have been on my knees since I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, even when I was defiant. I've been asking God to help me since I got in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, and he has never, ever, ever failed me. He has shown up. He has given me everything that I've asked for and answered everything. He gave me to you. He has literally answered everything that I've asked him for. I... uh had a few sticking points with things. Like, I know that people say, like, and our book says, and um, I believe the 12 and 12, like, you know, only at, um, not to pray for yourself, but a lot of people forget the part where it says, if it will bear usefulness onto others, that it's okay to pray for yourself. And if you're struggling with something personal, like I was, like, whether it seems silly to somebody else or not, like, it's okay to take it to God because I would feel guilty asking him to help me with my face. I felt guilty. I didn't think that that was something. Why would God want to help me with my face? And I remember my sponsor saying, because you're useless like this. All you think about is your face. Ask him to help you with your face. Ask him. And I can look in the mirror today. I'm not over the moon that I ripped my face open. Like, I'm not like, oh, yay. You know, I had 75 surgeries on my face. This is great. But I can tell you that, like, 
I'm the most comfortable in my skin that I've been my entire life. Even with my skin different than it was then. I have a level of acceptance that I never had before. I didn't like it. I didn't, I didn't enjoy the change, but I know that if God hadn't done that to me, that I would have kept doing what I was doing out there. That if God hadn't slowed me down, I would always, because I've always been the type of person that could figure my way out of it, you know, or so you think. And I've seen a lot of people figure their way into a grave because they think that they can just have one more time or something else will, will, will be able to fix them. You know, um, there's this kid, Mike, that I don't know if he's here tonight, and I love him because he always says, um, hey, Liz, you know what my problem is? I shine up on the outside too fast. And now I thank God that I didn't. I'm okay with what happened, and, I, and it humbled me. And I hope that I can continue to be humbled and to be humble. Um, I don't know how long I have to talk here. <laughs> but Lee told me, and I like Lee, and I trust Lee, um, he said that when you're tapped out and you're done, just go sit down. And I said, what if I do that after 10 minutes? He's like, well, then I'll come get you. <laughs> But I'm tapped out, guys. I love Alcoholics Anonymous. I love what it's done for me. And thank you guys so much for letting me share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.